Webster's Dictionary defines an outliver as a survivor or one who lives beyond. The outlivers originally were those poor unfortunates who, in the late 17th century, were forced to leave the comforts of Fairfield to live in the wilderness, what we now know as Weston. Even after Weston broke away from Fairfield in 1787, that stubborn outliver mentality persisted, survived, and it still does. Uh, to this very day, Weston thinks of itself as different from any other town in Fairfield County. And in a way, I, I suppose we are. We have power failures when no one else does. Um, we don't necessarily know our neighbors, except perhaps during a power failure. We have no town water, no sewers, no industry, no condominiums, street lights, automobile dealers, community centers, franchises. We have no movies. We don't even have sidewalks. In fact, come to think of it, we don't have much of anything. And most of us want to keep it that way. Now, this little film called The Outlivers, 200 Years in Weston, is all about how we got to be so peculiar. Winters were always a good time in Weston. In 1794, a man called William Priest wrote, the chief amusement of the country girls in winter is sleigh riding, of which they are passionately fond, as indeed are the whole sex in this country. I never heard a woman speak of this diversion but with rapture. And on nights when the moon was full and the sleigh riding looked to be particularly good, they would put hot bags of sand into the sleighs to warm the riders. And at the end of the long night's ride, they would all converge on a pub called the Banks Tavern to warm up with a drink and a dance. The ladies usually took a glass of Madeira, but the boys drank flip. To make a quart of flip, you warm the ale over the fire, you beat up three or four eggs with four ounces of sugar and some ginger or nutmeg and a quarter of good old rum or brandy. And when the ale is near ready to boil, you pour it into one pitcher and the rum and eggs into the other and you turn one into the other until it is as smooth as cream. Then you stick a hot poker Oh, hello. <clears throat> to warm it up. I hear Charlie has asked the beers if he can tarry with Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what's tarrying? It's uh, when a man is enamored of a young lady he wishes to marry. He proposes the affair to her parents if they have no objection. They allow him to tarry with her one night in order to make his court with her. When it's bedtime, the girl's parents retire for the night, leaving the younger ones to uh, settle matters as they can. Uh, after sitting up for as long as they think proper, they get into bed together. They're decently dressed, of course, so as not to cause a scandal. If everything goes well, they marry. If not, they part. Uh, unless the man is obliged to marry her. But uh, obliged or not, and most of the time, they were not. Marry, they did. 
Back around 1682, the Fairfield colonists laid out long lots running from Long Island Sound west into the unsurveyed forest. The eldest son inherited the cleared land near the center of town, but the younger sons were forced to rest out a living in the wilderness to the west, forced to be outlivers. Even when Jonathan and I were courting, I was not wholly settled in my mind that Providence meant me to take a day's journey away from Mama and Papa and my friends and the church and everything that was good and familiar to me. Oh, the Lord has been good to us, I suppose. Gave us this land full of spiteful rocks that you can't dig a living out of. And my best cow died of Spavins last spring. Oh, did you hear my best friend Priscilla? She stayed in town and married Thaddeus, and now she wears French ribbons on her Sunday bonnet. Being a day's journey from Fairfield, the outlivers had to develop self-sufficiency and do without French ribbons. Of course, they still had their little differences with the people who lived in the center of town. It just doesn't seem right that we pay our rates to Fairfield and we still have no roads. John Lockwood told me just the other day when he went to town for new harness that he couldn't get anyone on the council to listen to him. And to make matters worse, he mired his team on the way out. It just doesn't seem right. And Jonathan's cousin Barbara, she doesn't know what she's going to be doing about baptizing her necks. It'll be born in winter, and she can't get to church. Seems to me to be ungodly. In 1755, the outlivers petitioned the General Assembly to have their own minister during the winter months. They asked to become a separate parish, Norfield. On the fourth day of July, 1757, the Reverend Mr. Samuel Sherwood was chosen to settle amongst us at Norfield Parish to undertake the work of the gospel ministry. Only God knows where we're going to find the money to build a meeting house for divine worship. Not to mention deciding on where we're going to build it. The Reverend Sherwood was surely a good preacher. He kept you awake all right with his preaching about the disease of sin. But most of all, he really raised the roof with his sermons about independence and the sinners who were Tories. There is but one general distinction of essential importance in the cause now depending. And that is to be made by drawing the dividing line between the true friends of our dear country and its constitutional liberties and privileges, civil and religious, and the base, treacherous, and perfidious enemies thereto. Oh, yeah. Liberty! We must unite our hearts and hands in the defense of our distressed country, bleeding under the cruel and murderous hands of unexampled tyranny. We must exert ourselves for our common safety and defense before destruction occurs. Praise the Lord! Let us praise the Lord in song. When the war broke out, the men of Norfield Parish, with the fiery encouragement of the Reverend Mr. Sherwood, jumped at the chance to serve in the Continental Army. David Morehouse, Lockwood Gray, Gillard Gray. David Osborne, Isaac Osborne. Ebenezer Lockwood, Gideon Lockwood. Christopher Godfrey, Daniel Godfrey, Isaac Godfrey, Jonathan Godfrey. When General William Tryon raided Fairfield, the Norfield men defended the town. Some residents of Fairfield fled to their outliver friends in Norfield Parish for protection. One of the landed gentry, a woman named Priscilla Burr, wrote, When we heard the British were on their way from New Haven, on the way to Fairfield, that night I heard Ken. But our people laughed at me and said that it was thunder. The next day, when the cannonading came close, we set forth for Pass in Sherwoods, which we reached before sundown. The house was full of refugees from Greenfield and Greens Farms. It is impossible to describe to you the trials of that shocking night. Although we were 10 miles out, we could see the flames very plain. 
but we have escaped the hands of those cruel monsters. When the war was over and independence won, the outlivers went back to their daily lives, but the spirit of independence had grown. On the second Thursday of October, 1787, the men of Norfield Parish met again. Resolved by this assembly that all the inhabitants who live within the limits of the parish of North Fairfield and all those who live in that part of the parish of Norfield, which lies in the township of Norfield in said county, be hereby incorporated into a distinct separate town by the name of the town of Weston. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. The ayes carry the vote. Even though they were now Westonites, they were still outlivers. And they kept building houses, clearing the land, sowing and harvesting as they had for generations. And as does the Bible recommend, so did they multiply. But of course, their children needed schools. Between 1795 and 1856, there were eight one-room schools dotted around Weston. My husband, Mr. Gray, being a school visitor, helps to select the teachers. Last night, they decided, those whom we shall approve as instructors shall be able to read the English language with readiness, R-E-D-I-N-E-S, write a good fine hand, be well versed in arithmetic, and prove that they can spell correctly, S-P-E-L. Weston also had an elite private school called the Weston Boarding School, started in 1835 and operated by Andrew Jarvis. It cost $200 to go there. And since it was a military school, the state provided muskets and drums to the students. But their uniforms were obtainable only from Brooks Brothers, Catherine and Cherry Streets, New York City. Weston kept its public one-room schoolhouses until the late 1920s when Horace C. Hurlbert, Jr. offered the town 10 acres on which to build an up-to-date school. And at a town meeting in 1929... ...to accept the property offered by Mr. Hurlbert for a school site. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay. The motion carries. The motion has been made and seconded that we appropriate for the purpose of erecting and building a schoolhouse and auditorium, a sum not to exceed $50,000. Order. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay. The motion is carried. Guests, parents, relatives, teachers, and most importantly, members of the class of 1987, welcome to this year's graduation. Schooling ended earlier back in the 18th century when everyone was a farmer, at least part of the year. I went to school in the winter and summer until I was around eight. Then, my father needing me to work on the farm, I went in the winter until I was 14 and could do a man's job. To tell you the truth, I didn't like school much anyway. Well, if you're such a big man, then get yourself into the field with the others and start working. Almost no one made much of a living from the rocky soil. Oh, this land isn't much good for farming. Oh, we grow apples and onions and potatoes, but mostly we dig out these awful rocks. But if the land wasn't especially good for farming, it certainly was blessed with water. The fast-running streams and waterfalls powered grist mills and lumber mills. The land was good for lumber. Weston's hills were covered with great stands of chestnut trees, as well as forests of oak and black walnut. And there was iron. In 1805, Oliver Sanford brought his forge from Reading to Weston, where the charcoal was abundant and cheap. In 1850, there were some small manufacturing enterprises in Weston, but in 10 years' time, Gershom Bradley's Edge Tool Company had eclipsed all the others and employed 40 of the 53 industrial workers who lived in Weston. 
When the Civil War came in 1861, some young men signed up eagerly. Although from the earliest days, a few Western farmers had black slaves. For instance, the estate of the fiery Reverend Sam Sherwood, who died in 1783, included two slaves. It is said that some of Weston's stone walls were built with slave labor. Despite this, rumors persist to this day that there was a house in Weston which was a sanctuary for slaves escaping on their way to Canada and freedom. At the beginning of the Civil War, a group of about 50 freed slaves lived in a small community near Valley Forge called Little Egypt. Although Weston supported the Union cause, the town never did support Lincoln. In 1864, when the rest of the state voted overwhelmingly for Honest Abe, Weston persisted in voting for his opponent, General George McClellan. By 1870, old Gershom Bradley's Edge Tool Company was the only thriving factory in Weston. Well, excuse me, uh, Mr. Conlon. Miles Bradley, Bradley Edge Tools, Weston, Connecticut. You know, uh, we're celebrating our 60th year in Weston, Connecticut. In fact, this year, I've just taken over the business from my father. Are you familiar with Weston, sir? No. Well, it's quite a little community. Uh, in fact, it's growing by leaps and bounds. And I'll bet you, Mr. Conlon, and I'm not a betting man, sir, that by the year 1900, Weston, Connecticut is going to outstrip Bridgeport in industrial productivity. How about that? Gee, this is quite a nice hardware store you have here, Mr. Conlon. Yep. I think I can show you some sure-fire sellers in our new catalog. Perhaps you'd like to take a look at this uh, lath hatchet. No. Mr. Conlon, are you aware that Bradley Edge Tools lath hatchets, grub hose, and axes are clearing vast territories of the great far west, all over these great United States? Not interested in a lath hatchet, all right? Perhaps I can make you a deal on a Bradley Edge Tools bush hook. You know, we sold an awful lot of these bush hooks to plantations down south before the war, and I'm sure there's going to be quite a call for them again as soon as Johnny Reb gets back on his feet. Not much call for bush hooks here. Mr. Conlon, I tell you what I'm going to do. Just for you, I am going to make you a deal. A dozen bush hooks for $8. What do you say? No. Nope. Would you take a half dozen bush hooks? Mr. Conlon, I'd hate to see you without some bush hooks in your inventory. I happen to have a couple of old used bush hooks out in the back of my wagon. Not interested. All right, I'm going to leave my catalog with you, Mr. Conlon, and the next time I'm in the neighborhood, you can depend upon a, a visit from Miles Bradley, Bradley Edge Tools, Weston, Connecticut. Yep. Yep. I can't give these bush hooks away. Wait up, huh? In the early 1900s, the languishing factory burned down, and Weston's brief brush with modern industry ended forever. Out of work, finding it impossible to make ends meet, people left town. But when the Merritt Parkway was built, as far as exit 42, the Western Road exit, adventurous New Yorkers in search of land and woods and cheap houses began to trickle in. We had no clothes, we had second-hand cars and nowhere to live. And we lived in chicken coops and barns and that's where the charm came in. Artists, musicians, writers, actors, and other creative types all converged on the little town to become themselves outlivers. I wanted to uh, uh, be in the country and get away from the various distractions of New York uh, to a writer, the uh, the traffic noises and the telephone ringing and the temptations of Columbus Avenue and like in the center area where we were and um, in Weston I've uh, uh, found a number of new distractions the squirrels and the chipmunks uh, outside and an occasional deer crossing the lawn you can you know you can look at it, exchange looks with a dough for as long as five minutes. Uh, so I would say um, uh, Weston is about an ideal place for, um, uh, for not working. 
as, as I've been able to find. And right down at the end of my own land, there's a huge rock on a hill on which the great Metropolitan Opera star Lawrence Tibbet used to stand and rehearse his Wagnerian arias, serenading the evening light as it filtered through the thick woods around him. He called it Brunhilde's Rock. I don't know. Perhaps it's the uneventful pace of the town that made them all come here. But artists still live in Western. Back in the 1940s and 50s, the new people wanted to keep things the way they were when they moved to Weston. Some of them opposed any change, which the earlier residents were only too happy to see. For instance, flooding Valley Forge for the reservoir was bitterly argued by the Johnny-come-latelys. The old-timers won. But on some issues, Westernites thought alike. In 1930, the Norfield Grange pushed for better roads. The 20th century was moving into Weston in other ways. Weston Center was built in 1950. It is second only to the schools as the focus of town activity. It's where you run into your neighbor on Saturday morning. Hi. You know my daughter, Lisa? Hi, Lisa. Hi. Yes, uh, Lisa's in Weston High School. Hi. Well, well, Lee's home for the weekend. She's at Andover. Oh, um, well, you know, Lisa's on the swim team. No kidding. Yeah. Well, well, Lee's captain of the field hockey team. Right. Um, you just made the honor roll, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Well, Lee's president of the class. Uh, well, it's nice seeing you, Dick. Nice to see yeah, you, Listen, we'll see you around. We've got to go to the uh, drugstore. Sure. Okay. You can also buy a stamp. I need $50,000 worth of insurance. Uh, this will not go through that way, because we know it's more than hard. No, no, I just said it. Not placing much reliance on anyone but themselves, and not wanting to be beholden to anyone, the Western outlivers have always taken responsibility for their own town. In 1931, the Western Volunteer Fire Department was formed. And that independent volunteer spirit is with us yet. We run every year a fun drive and don't have to ask the town for anything and don't get anything from the town. And we feel this way the ambulance probably operates the best. They thought about starting the ambulance. A letter came around that they needed volunteers from the ambulance. And I was trained as a medic in the Israeli army, so I figured this is one thing I can do for the community and join. Weston is still run by volunteers. They spend months putting together community shows. They run community projects. They work at fairs. They manage the political life of the town. And then I said, well, if you promise me I'll lose, I'll, I'll run for the office. And they jokingly said, oh, sure, we'll promise you that you'll lose. So it was an accident that I became first selectman. But uh, I, I can't say I've regretted uh, uh, a minute of it. It's been a wonderful experience, and I'm glad it happened. And they spend endless hours on boards and commissions and committees. But just what do outlivers think about Weston? <laughs> I must tell you about my first experience going to a town hall meeting. And this was one of the grandest things I'd ever seen in my life. You've never seen democracy in real action, where anybody could get up and say, 
I'm not going to pay that. And they always argue about taxes. And I was just thrilled about this whole, can't believe this Jefferson bit you I'm looking at. Things happened in the town, and no one ever knew what had happened. And so, the only newspaper we've ever heard of, including any of the New England Press Association has ever heard of, that was started for the purpose of communication and not for making money, was born. The house behind the uh, church where we held uh, town meetings and that's where I held court. And the center had been put in. Now we have a zoning and two-acre zoning. And we had everything there but whiskey store. Then you, then you had all your groceries and your hardware stuff, but you had to go into Westport to get a bottle of whiskey. So we got all together, all our <clears throat> drinking friends, and we're sitting on one side of the room, and the blue nose is sitting over here. It said it was too close to the church. You couldn't wake in that one. And I have enough votes to win. And uh, we're good, doing just fine. I, at the appropriate time, I said, I think we should have a vote. And they said, all right. And just as they passed the hat, every town has a town drunk, right? Every, every little town. <laughs> the two big doors opened up like this. And here sends our town drunk with his pants cleared under his knees. He said, I can't wear red blooded American boy can't get a drink in this damn town. And we lost. <laughs> the town meetings are still going on. A contrary, ornery, independent bunch. We outlivers plan to stick around for another 200 years or so. Motion has been made and seconded that we stick around for another 200 years or so. All in favor of the motion say aye. aye. All opposed say no. No. The motion is carried. Yeah.